Hello everybody, welcome back. We are in our next chapter in Principles of Macroeconomics. We are looking at uh, supply and demand now. So in the last video, we finished up talking about command economies, market economies, and particularly how market economies are the predominant economic system in the world now, and particularly among uh, developed countries. And these market economies involve very complex interactions between buyers and sellers. And so that's what this chapter is all about, starting to look at that, understand, understanding the mechanics of supply and demand, and then ultimately we're going to be applying these ideas to some macroeconomic concepts and phenomenon, like minimum wage, uh, price floors and price ceilings, labor markets, uh, and so on. So we're going to dive in here. We're going to break down supply and demand individually. And then we're going to put it all together to talk about the equilibrium. And, um, and then we'll do, we'll do some examples and some policy analysis. So uh, let's dive in here. Um, we're going to start with demand, see how long that uh, takes us, and probably create a, a couple videos out of, out of this chapter. So uh, diving in here. When we're talking about markets uh, and supply and demand, one critical assumption in this framework, in this modeling framework for economics, is that we have a, a good amount of competition in the, in the environment. So both among the buyers and the sellers, we're, we're modeling kind of competitive markets. And competitive market has a lot of buyers, a lot of sellers, such that no individual actor has can have an effect on the price. Um, and if you take that to the extreme, in the perfectly competitive market, you have this idea that there's no um, there's there's no um, price control among any buyers and sellers. Um, we have this first bullet point that all goods are exactly the same exactly the same we can call this homogenous um, and then buyers and sellers are so numerous that nobody has any effect on the price so we call these people both the buyers and the and the sellers price takers Okay, um, the, other, the other thing we should, I guess, mention as a, as a one-third and kind of important characteristic of perfectly competitive markets is that there are low barriers to entry, which makes it easy to have a number of uh, sellers in a market. So let's talk about <clears throat> a couple examples here. And keep in mind, as we're going through this chapter, we're kind of assuming in a supply and demand framework that markets are perfectly competitive. And the more competitive the markets are, the more appropriate this type of analysis will be. Okay, so let's take some examples of competitive markets and keep these ideas in mind. So agricultural commodities, um, especially historically. Okay, because we have a lot of buyers of agricultural products and a lot of farmers, a lot of sellers of agricultural products too. So take an example of, uh, you know, even, even today with something like farmer's markets. So you have a number of produce, produce growers, lots of sellers. You take it to a farmer's market and there are going to be a lot of buyers coming to the farmer's market as well. One producer's lettuce is going to be similar to another producer's lettuce. So the goods are homogenous. They're, they're pretty equal to each other. And, um, and it's fairly low barriers to entry as well, right? It's pretty easy to start a little garden in your backyard. Um, even to have a, a very small scale farm without huge machinery, uh, relatively low barriers to entry especially when we start to compare it to some of these other um, non-competitive markets. 
in a minute. So also urban labor markets, urban in particular, because in big cities you have lots of buyers, lots of sellers, and if you know if if a firm is looking for an accountant and two people have accounting degrees, in a way they're very homogenous or they're very similar in what they're offering. So um, urban labor markets also quite competitive. A uh, couple more examples. Uh, let's take pizza. In most towns, and particularly in large cities, lots of sellers, certainly lots of buyers, and fairly similar products across across the um, spectrum. Uh, also, bread in general. We could throw coffee in there, particularly retail coffee from a grocery store. We've got lots of brands to choose from, um, and certainly lots of buyers. I'll add one more uh, and, and just briefly discuss cars. So cars are fairly competitive, the automobile market, but that's primarily due to international trade, right? We only have a few uh, car manufacturing companies in the United States. If we restricted trade and didn't allow any more car manufacturers to sell within the United States, it would be a very concentrated, very oligopolistic market, but because we have German and Japanese and Korean and, and many other cars from different countries, this international trade creates more competition, more buyers and sellers, um, and so generally it, it promotes this idea of, uh, of a competitive market. Okay, and then just a few examples of non-competitive markets. Airlines, although that's that fluctuates over time. Um, you have the three big players, which would be Delta, American, and United. You might throw Southwest in there as well. Um, but there has been a bit of an expansion of regional airlines. So this one, um, depending on the time, it could go up toward uh, a more competitive market. And sometimes throughout history, it's been a much less competitive market. The eyeglasses industry is actually very uh, non-competitive. Many, um, there are many brands that you might recognize like Oakley and Ray-Ban, Lens Crafters, the entire, the entire company of Lens Crafters, all of them are kind of held by this holding company called Luxottica. So one company, Luxottica, an Italian company, has a huge amount of market power over the entire eyeglasses industry. Uh, a couple more examples. So first would be pop, as I call it, coming from the Midwest, or soda. Um, out here, out west um, in Colorado, some people call it generally Coke. But if you think about kind of the, the general Coke versus Pepsi, you've got, you've got two companies there. Um, not a monopoly, but if they're two primary companies, then we call that a duopoly. So... Coke and Pepsi um, definitely have a lot of market power. Certainly not a very competitive market, even with a couple generics in there as well. Uh, and then finally, um, I'm going to say rural town shops. And this could even be, you know, up here we talked about a competitive market being pizza, right? It is possible that if you live in a rural and maybe especially remote town that only has one pizza shop, that pizza shop is going to have market power and maybe even a monopoly on pizza in the town. So uh, it's quite possible to have competitive markets in, in, in for some goods to have normally competitive markets. But if you move to the outskirts and into remote areas, even typically competitive goods and services can become non-competitive as well. Okay, so again, we're going to be assuming competitive markets when we're talking about uh, supply and demand. And again, the, the more competitive it is, the more appropriate the model is as well. In the next video, we're going to pick it up with demand. Um, we're going to talk about the 
demand, the demand curve, the law of demand, um, and then talk about things that change demand uh, within an economy. All right, so I will see you then. Um, stay tuned. Thanks.